So good, thank you. And Peter, thank you. We release Jono, we can release you now too. Bless you. But stay at City Chapel though. <laughs> so good, hey, it's uh, so good to be here. I honestly find it an amazing honour to be able to share the word and I don't take it lightly. Um, and just to hear the story about what God has done in the life of Jono, you know, this is uh, so encouraging, but what Jono's message to you is that this is his prayer for you, is that you also will encounter God in a, in a powerful way, that you also will bear witness of the great things that God has done in your life. And that's my prayer for you today. And I just believe that as we get into the Word and as we talk about the things of the Holy Spirit together, that we are we're going to be bearers of, of, of God's greatness, his, his grace, His love, for us, we're going to bear that news to other people around us. But more than that, I feel like we're going to be encouraged today. We're going to be encouraged and empowered by the Holy Spirit as we continue this series of the Holy Spirit. So if I could ask every head to be bowed in this moment in honour of God's word as we pray. Father, thank you so much. We're so grateful, God, for you. We're grateful for your presence and we don't take it lightly. You're the ancient of days. You're the first and the last. You're the beginning and the end. You are the alpha and the omega. Your kingdom has no end. Even though you are the creator of all that we see, all the galaxies you breathed, Father God, you spin the planets on your fingers, Father God. You have the capacity to have an intimate relationship with every single person even though there's billions of us. You are so big, you are so vast, you are so powerful, yet you are so gentle. You're so sensitive to our needs. You're so attentive to each of us. You're so focused on our personal lives. Let us never forget the intimacy that we can have with you. And we thank you for this intimacy that Jesus died for so that we could enter in to a loving relationship with you. It sums up who we are and the reason why we're here today, to walk in unison with you, God. So I pray more than anything for you to make yourself known to every person, Holy Spirit, that you would move in such a dynamic and powerful way that you don't even need a preacher, but you can communicate the way you want to. But we're all here to serve you, God, and to honour you, to worship you. May you have your way, Holy Spirit, in every heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know when you mention things about the Holy Spirit and they're not derogatory, they're actually positive, they're, they're things about the goodness of God, because the Holy Spirit always does one thing. Everything that the Holy Spirit does is to point people to Jesus. So he empowers us. He encourages us. He enables us to walk and to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's role in the Godhead is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role is to point us to Jesus. But then time and time again, through Scripture and the New Testament, it seemed like Jesus' role was always to point to the Holy Spirit. He said, it is to your advantage that I go, Jesus said. It is better that I go because then, guys, you will have the Holy Spirit with you. Then the adventure truly begins. You think you've seen great things here with me walking with you. Oh, no. <laughs> you just wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. So it's like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are constantly advocating for each other. In the book of First, in the book of Genesis, it says, let's make man in our image. Father is talking to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus, saying, let's make man in our image. It's a beautiful union. It's a beautiful communion. It's a beautiful fellowship. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a beautiful fellowship. Second Corinthians urges us 
to join in the fellowship of God through the Holy Spirit. There's a few names of the Holy Spirit. And if we want to know how the Holy Spirit makes a difference in our lives, let's have a look at the names that we can see in the Bible. He's comforter. He's counselor. The Holy Spirit is teacher. He's a baptizer. He's an advocate. He advocates for us. He advocates for Jesus. He advocates for God the Father. He's an advocate. He gives us a promise, and he is the promise. He's the promise himself. He's the strengthener. He's the sanctifier. He's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, the spirit of grace, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of God, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of life. He guides us into all truth. So how do we do life without any of those things? And to say no to the Holy Spirit is saying no to God. Saying no to the Holy Spirit in your life is saying no to Jesus because Jesus came in flesh, fully man and fully God, and pointed us to the person of the Holy Spirit and said, if you want to live a dynamic life as a believer, you need to receive the Holy Spirit first. So that's why it's imperative that at churches we talk about the Holy Spirit and we're not afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. Churches that lean into the Holy Spirit are the churches that are doing God's will. You can see it right across the world. Jesus even depended on the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week, that Jesus, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was taught by the Holy Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He was sent by the Holy Spirit. He listened to the Holy Spirit. And he ministered through the Spirit's power. Now, if Jesus needed and depended upon the Holy Spirit, then shouldn't we? Then wouldn't we need the Holy Spirit? If the book of Acts talks about the Holy Spirit time and time again, and the disciples in the early church truly depended on the Holy Spirit, then why do we shy away from the Holy Spirit? It is the least, he is the least talked about member in the Godhead. But if you look at Scripture, he's the only member of the Godhead that you cannot blaspheme against. You cannot blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 to 32 says this in the New King James Version. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men and women. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now let me give you an analogy just to help you understand exactly what this means. So, for example, if you say something to me, Teo, you are a horrible person. I'm okay with that. Teo, you are a person that you're just so silly and I can't stand you. And every time you enter the room, it just it makes me cringe. I hate you, Teo. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. But you say anything about my wife and then I'll let you know I've had it. You say anything about Lucy and, woo, boy, I don't know what it is. Something takes over me. It's like, you can say anything about me. That's fine. I mean, you know, even uh, a time where there was someone that was close to Lucy, um, you know, started to say negative things about her and attacked her verbally, right? And uh, if they did that to me, I'm fine. But for some reason, I just flared up and I said, mate, you can never talk to my wife like that ever 
See, God the Father, God the Son, are like you don't ever talk about the Holy Spirit like that. That's the spirit in which Jesus is talking about. You can talk about me. You can crucify me. Don't you dare talk about God the Spirit. I can't tolerate that. I will never have that. And so for us as a church, it's important that we not only treasure, but we so value the presence of the Holy Spirit. We honour and revere. We're reverent to the Holy Spirit. And we can grieve the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I love what Isaac said, that if you make a mistake, God doesn't just leave you. A lot of Christians are deceived. They think that as soon as they make a mistake, that God goes, I'm displeased with you. That is so opposite to the gospel message. The gospel message isn't that. The gospel message is that now you are united with God the Father through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he paid on the cross at Calvary. Now we are together and we have been adopted and now we have been grafted into the family of God. Family, you don't just say, if my son says, look, Dad, I'm going to make a mistake, do I just go, look, Isaac, Get away from me, never talk to me. No, why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. I've been grafted into the family of God. Isaac is part of my family. I will never leave him nor forsake him. And that's what God does for us. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I remember after doing an extensive time of prayer and fasting, and um, I did this and I was a very new Christian. Okay, I was a very new Christian. I didn't know all the, the laws and I didn't know all the so-called rules. But pretty much the Bible, I don't see it as just laws and rules. I see it as beautiful, powerful principles that help me to live the best life possible for me and to be able to change the world around me, to help people as much as I can. The Bible is life. It's not just rules. But before I knew all the principles of God through the word of God, I I didn't understand the nature and the character and how I can serve God in in a way that my life is holy. And so as a very new Christian, I went to a nightclub again because I used to go to a nightclub. And for those of you who don't know know what a nightclub is, it's, it's where the decibel levels are so high that they damage your ears and people act like they're in a zoo and they make crazy noise. <laughs> Don't, it's seriously, it's a waste of time. Oh, my gosh, so bad. Anyway, I went to a nightclub and I was so grieved. And I'm like, what, what's this? I don't know the principles in the Bible but I can sense the Holy Spirit in me. And the Holy Spirit in me was grieving. Did the Holy Spirit leave and leave the nightclub? No. The Holy Spirit is in us. So as we partake in ungodly activity, as we partake in sin and addiction, the Holy Spirit grieves. but doesn't just walk out of our lives, but we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And so this makes it, beautiful and personal in our lives, that as we walk with God, because we know that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, the beauty and the positive side of this is that we actually know that we're in partnership now with the Holy Spirit. If you look at it from a different angle, we're actually in partnership. So whatever we do, whatever we say, we can actually let the Holy Spirit into our lives. As you read the Bible, there's probably a reason why you're not getting much out of it. It's probably because you haven't invited the Holy Spirit into that place of reading the Word. Because you can never learn anything or get any revelation of the nature of God unless you get revelation. See, information is just facts on earth. But revelation is information downloaded from heaven. And that's what we need as we read the Scriptures. But you see, this relationship that we have, comes out of a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, he empowers us 
with gifts and allows us to bear fruit in our life. So not only do we have a relationship with him, but he also gives us these incredible gifts. And they're found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, and then 7 to 8 in the New King James Version I'm going to read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led, for to one is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one the same spirit works all these distributing to each one individually as he wills. So that's found in 1 Corinthians. It's probably best if you go back and read it yourself because everything that is here is just I'm, just, I'm just sharing from what I feel God has shown me. But the best thing you can do is go back to your Bible and learn for yourself. See, so God gives us these gifts. And as I started to understand that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are now for us, not just for the special person preaching on the stage. No, actually, God pours out his spirit on all flesh, the Bible says. Even in the Old Testament, that I will pour out my spirit on all sons and daughters, all flesh. And so that applies to me now. And so as I started to understand that I have the gifts of the spirit, I said maybe I'm going to try and believe in the gift of healing for my life. And so I was down in Melbourne and I was asked to speak at a church and the church there had a few problems and I'm just thinking, what problems do you have? Because I can only bring the word and I can only encourage you, but there's, that's all I can do. And they said, no, 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 there's a lot of sick people. And I said, well, you know, maybe you need the Holy Spirit. But then the Holy Spirit challenged me and I sensed him saying, I'm going to use you, Teo, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to flow out of you. So you, they've requested you to speak at their church you actually now have to operate. You have to turn up, not just on time, but turn up with the artillery, with a tool belt full of tools and gifts that I've given you. And you're to allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to flow through you. And so you know what I had? I had this lady come up to the front and uh, I was very uh, scared and intimidated because she said to me, she said to me and presented to me an impossible situation. You know what she said? She goes, oh, pastor, pastor, um, I need a miracle. And I said, what is this miracle that you need? And she said, I am barren. So the doctors and specialists have said that I will never, ever, ever be able to have children. Ever. Never. And that's my lot in life. That's, that's who I am. That's my situation. I'll never be able to have kids for eight years, Pastor, my husband and I have been praying for a child because we feel that we received a word from God saying that he will give us a child. Pastor, pray with us, pray for us. And just then, like that, I just sensed, like that, the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like an audible voice. It was just like a, she'll be healed. Just tell her. And I'm like, what? She'll be healed. She'll be fine. Just tell her. I'm like, I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit while I'm praying for and with them. So I'm, I'm trying to do what no man does well, is to multitask, right? So I'm just, oh, no, 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 no. Sounds like a Japanese show. What are we doing? Someone speaking in tongues over here, man. And I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, tell them that they will have a child this time next year. I'm like, no, I don't, Holy Spirit, I don't do dates and times. Like that's for, you know, the guys on television or whatever. I don't do that. That's not what I do. And they're like, are you okay, Pastor? Are you talk who are you talking to? Like you keep looking to the left. I'm like, no, 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 this is my right. Um, anyway, so I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says this time next year they'll have a child. And I'm like, okay. So I don't usually do that, guys. I don't usually bring up dates or times or anything like that because I'm not too – big on myself. I want to be big on God. You know what I mean? I know I get things wrong. But this time, I knew. 
that it'll happen. So I said to the lady, I said, hold my hand. And then, husband, hold my hand. You'll have a child. That's all I said. Did I say this time next year? No. I don't want to be big on myself. I want to be big on God. I said, you'll have a child. And I just laid my hand on her belly. In Jesus' name, be healed. Just like that. Just like that. And I knew. So um, crazy thing is I got invited to preach 12 months later to the same church. They brought in a baby. Why? How? Oh, you were right. You were right. But you're always right. You're always right. And that's the journey that we're on. He's always right. But see, we have these gifts that we can operate in. And we will talk about more of those in detail later, but we actually are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Each of us, every one of us, whether we feel competent and confident, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You don't have to, oh, was I confident? Was I competent? No, never done it like that before. Never prayed for someone to have a child like that before. I didn't think that the Holy Spirit was going to definitely do that, but the Holy Spirit gave me faith. You can do nothing without the Holy Spirit for God. No, nah. you think you are, but it's not fruit that will last. We need the Holy Spirit for everything. And then the fruits of the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 in the New King James Version. He doesn't just give us gifts. We don't just focus on gifts. If we were a church that was just to focus on gifts, we would be a zoo. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the character of God. I don't care how gifted I am. I want the fruit before the gift. I want to be more like Jesus rather than appear to be more like Jesus on the outside, if that makes sense. I want to truly be more like Jesus on the inside. This is where the fruits come into play. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. The law is summed up in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. If you can abide by these, if you can see these outworking in your life, then it gives us a pretty clear indication that you've been walking with the Holy Spirit. If we don't see any of these things operating in your life, in our life, in my life, and we're operating in gifts of the Holy Spirit, seeing people get healed, prophetic words, words of knowledge, you're not really walking with God. Because God doesn't care just about the gifts. You know, it says in the book of Matthew, right? Get away from you. I never knew you. But God, I cast demons out in your name. But Lord, like I did so many things. Get away. I never knew you. See, so God's not looking just at the gifts. He's looking at the fruit. Are we truly walking with God? The gifts aren't impressive to me. The fruit, the outworking of the fruit's impressive to me. The member of the Godhead that unites us and brings us together to continue to, to continue the work of Christ and point people to Christ, this is the Holy Spirit. He actually brings us together in fellowship to do significant things for God. The Holy Spirit has actually brought us together as a community. You may not feel totally part of the community, but maybe if the Holy Spirit has brought you to this community, you are. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 says this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Talks about the grace of Jesus Christ. When we think about Jesus, we think about his grace. When we think about God the Father, we think of the tender love of a father. The validation that we get, good on you, son, good on you, daughter. 
That's what we're reminded of when we think about God the Father, a loving Father. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's got to be a sense of fellowship and intimacy. See, that word in the Greek of fellowship, it is koinonia. Koinonia means communion, sharing together, partnership, participation, and intimacy. See, if we're to have fellowship, there's to be intimacy. There's a partnership. So when Lucy and I talk about the future, when we plan about the future, we have a conversation about it. We're in partnership. She's my partner. So we talk about things. We plan things. We discuss things. We're, we're there to nut things out and go, hey, what about this? What about that? What about in three years or five years? What, what are things going to look like? What are we praying for? What are we believing for? We have partnership. We have a conversation. And it's no different with the Holy Spirit. There's got to be fellowship. There's got to be some form of intimacy. There's got to be some form of participation and partnership. So we will never move forward in the things of God without a partnership with the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus says it's important that you stay and you wait here and don't go anywhere until you receive that divine partnership. <laughs> don't go anywhere until you receive that beautiful divine fellowship. Don't go anywhere until you understand true intimacy through the Holy Ghost. Don't go anywhere so we're supposed to have koinonia with the Holy Spirit because he points to the grace of Jesus and the love of the Father, but it only happens through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one that we can't blaspheme. And he also is the one that we shouldn't lie to, we cannot lie to. I remember reading it, brought shivers down my spine when I read this in the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 4 how Paul rebukes Ananias because Ananias lied and he fell down dead. And Paul, before that, he rebukes him and says, you, you actually lied to the Holy Spirit. That's what is happening here. Can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, cannot lie to the Holy Spirit. See, take him seriously with reverence and awe. The Holy Spirit, now we know that he, that he empowers us with gifts, enables us to bear fruit, brings us together to continue the work of Christ. But then why do we shy away from the Holy Spirit? What, why? Why do, we, why do we try and skim across the Holy Spirit? Why don't we talk about the Holy Spirit? Why don't we read Scripture? Why do we skim across Scriptures when it talks about the Holy Spirit? Why do we do that? I believe that the reason why we do that is because, A, we're afraid. And because we're afraid of what we do not know. So I believe that we have a bunch of people that don't really understand the Godhead member of the Holy Spirit and how to have an intimate relationship with him. I honestly don't believe we understand. And so whatever we don't understand, we are afraid of, and that fear cultivates a withdrawal in our lives. So we withdraw. We talk about Jesus. We talk about God. But then the Bible says, man, don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Advocates for the Holy Spirit time and time and time and time again. But then the church skims over the Holy Spirit like we didn't hear anything. And we cover it with it's all about Jesus so that we don't have to talk about other truths in the Scripture that are holistic, give us a holistic approach to our relationship with God. It is all about Jesus. But Jesus has told us you need fellowship. Wait for the promise. You need the Holy Spirit. Jesus depended upon the Holy Spirit, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus points us to the Holy Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. We don't allow the Holy Spirit in our services there's reasons for this, and I'm going to go through a few of those reasons. But we don't allow the Holy Spirit in our services, and particularly in our liturgy. You know, liturgy, you might break down the meaning of liturgy. It's a Greek term, liturgia. It, it simply means the work for the people or the service for the people. 
or it's a public service to honor God. So it's, it's systematic, it's, it, it's what you put into, for example, your program. That's what we have narrowed it down to as human beings. But a lot of the time we don't make room in our man-made programs for the Holy Spirit. This is the sad thing because it used to be. It used to be in even what people know to be as conservative and traditional churches. Even conservative and traditional churches somewhere, whether they were founded upon a revival or a move or a breakout of miracles, or somewhere along the line they have put into their constitution that you need the Holy Spirit. It's, it's there. You can see it. Even the Catholic Church, they don't appoint a leader of the Catholic Church until there is a representation of the Holy Spirit moving in them. For example, my brother was appointed to be a priest, anointed to be a priest in the Catholic Church. And there he is in the middle of the service laying prostrate, face down on the ground, weeping under the power of God. This is in the Catholic Church. You cannot appoint a leader until someone has shown reverence for the Holy Spirit and for the power of God moving in their life. This is the Catholic Church. We need to partner with all churches, I'm telling you. Churches that proclaim Jesus and are abiding by the word. The Anglican bishop, St. Benedict, he quotes this, very high, respected Anglican bishop. We are right to worship the Holy Ghost and open ourselves up to the presence of God, for he is God and God and is the light of lights. So here we have a high Anglican bishop of the and he is proclaiming to the churches and saying we need to be open to the presence of the Holy Spirit and walk intimately with the Holy Spirit. If you're to call yourself a Christian, if you're to go to an Anglican church, then abide by the Holy Spirit. That's what the leader of leaders is saying, right? And then you have a look at Salvation Army. Denomination after denomination, they're seeing a move of the Holy Spirit. So the de denomination of Salvation Army was born out of a revival. Uh, William Booth was this, the leader of this revival. He was born in 1829. He grew up in the Methodist church. And what happened was, as the pastor and preacher of a Methodist church, he saw so much salvation taking place, so many salvations, such an outbreak of healings, such an outbreak of miracles and wonders and signs, that they actually kicked him out of the church of the Methodist church because there was too much. But there was a revival and pockets of revival. But William Booth learnt from his forefathers of the Methodist church who also saw an outpouring and an outbreak of the Holy Spirit. Miracles, signs and wonders through the Methodist church took place in the 1700s. And in 1829, as he was born, God put him on earth and he started an incredible revival. And that, out of the Methodist church, he went up the road, went to a tent revival meeting, got slain in the spirit and started what we know as the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army's motto was to see people saved and to see people set free by the fire and the power of the Holy Ghost, the fire of God, to come down, to burn sin and to set broken and sick bodies free. That's the mission of the Salvation Army. But then, you know, as time went by, they ministered to the slums of London, outbreak of community service, and uh, the famous sermon that was preached by William Booth is called and titled The Blood of Christ and the Fire of the Holy Spirit. That's the famous sermon that he preached, he believed in the fire of the power of God. So much so that everybody knew that miracles were breaking out in the Salvation Army that they read, wrote a massive article on this and it was called Strange Beautiful Things Happen When God Has His Own Way With a Man or Woman because they saw such unusual miracles of limbs that were growing back, eyeballs that were going, growing back in the eye socket in the 18, early 1800s. They were seeing a revival and a move of the Holy Ghost that they wrote article after article about 
the unusual miracles that they were witnessing. But now the Salvation Army, they have written 15 spiritual gifts. I've seen seven in my Bible, but there's 15 spiritual gifts in the Salvation Army. But they have taken out the spiritual gift of healing, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues and miracles, and it's been replaced by hospitality, the, gift, the spiritual gift of hospitality. And that happened as time progressed. And as we know, the Methodist church has done similar um, over the years. And I'm not saying that they're bad and bad people. I'm just talking about the history of the church because we are birthed out of, we are part of the church, right? So John and Charles Wesley, who are four leaders of the Methodist movement, Methodist church, they saw unusual miracles break out in the 1700s. John Wesley preached something like 42,000 sermons. He is a, a general of the faith, a forefather of the faith, an incredible mover and shaker of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit began, this is what John Wesley says, he quotes, the Holy Spirit began to move among us with amazing power when we met him. In his name. These unusual works of the Holy Spirit continued to follow and bless my ministry. He quotes that in the 1700s. John Wesley, brother of Charles Wesley, both incredible leaders and ministers. And then an author by the name of Tim Cook, he writes a book, Miracles and the Supernatural Throughout the Church History. And he talks about the move of God through John and Charles Wesley's ministry. So we see that even the Presbyterian church was birthed out of a revival, a Welsh revival that took place in the Methodist church and other leaders that came from there. That happened in the 18th century. The Uniting Church came from the Methodist and the Presbyterian Church and even some leaders, incredibly well-respected leaders of Uniting Churches. There's a pastor called Reverend Herman Nienabar, and he's from South Africa, and he states this. He says, we must see faith, we must see miracles, and we must see healings in our services. Uniting church pastor. And I've run out of time, but I could talk about this for hours. I mean, we see that we have the Holy Spirit move in our history. It's a part of our fabric. We have Holy Spirit origins. And it's time for churches to embrace the Holy Spirit Again, and the church has turned people off the Holy Spirit because we chase manifestations more than the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share this story and I'll close. I was at a service and I was preaching and I knew that the Holy Spirit was going to minister powerfully. And there was a lady and she was sitting on the third row. And as I was preaching, she started breaking out in loud laughter. And I'm like, I understand that. I understand that that was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But what's the Holy Spirit saying now and doing now? And I was grieved in my spirit because I knew that this person was chasing a manifestation rather than the presence of God and the person of the Holy Spirit himself. Holy Spirit said, make sure she closes her mouth. And I said, hey, woman, I'm just going to ask you just to keep it down because that's not what God's doing now. My spirit was deeply grieved. Because why? Because people chase the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in order to have a relationship with God. Because they think that the Holy Spirit is the manifestation. The Holy Spirit isn't the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And churches have chased the manifestation. They go to conference after conference looking for the Holy Ghost while all the while the Holy Spirit is right here in you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can experience the fullness of God right where you are in your own home. And you're supposed to bring that presence to church and to your world, to your workplace, to your family. You're supposed to bring the presence of God wherever you go. So I'm going to continue this, but we've run out of time. But this is my encouragement to us as a church. Don't chase the manifestation of the Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit is not the manifestation. The Holy Spirit 
is the Holy Spirit. And as we pursue God with all of our hearts, as we lift up the name of Jesus, as we revere God the Father and adore Him and honor Him and worship Him, I tell you, the Holy Spirit will move in such a profound and such a powerful way that you will not even be able to explain it to your friends. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. There will be fire and there will be power. Let's stand to our feet. Whew. Oh, God, you know that I've only gotten through half of what I wanted to, Father, but it's okay. Father, release your Holy Spirit on these beautiful people, God. <laughs> People would be open to your presence. People would be open. There would be koinonia in our church, God. An intimate walk with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Oh, God, that no one would leave without sensing your presence. That no one would do this week without acknowledging your presence in our lives, Holy Spirit. And Jesus, you advocate for the Holy Spirit time and time again. You point to the person of the Holy Spirit. Don't lie to him. Don't grieve him. Don't blaspheme him. Walk in intimacy with him. It's better that I go so you can have him. Precious Holy Spirit. Wow, I sense him now. I sense him in this room. Lift up your hands, church. Lift up your hands. Precious Holy Spirit. Thank you. Precious Holy Spirit. Divine healing and overflow. And overflow, Father God, not just of the manifestation, but an overflow of your presence. A revelation of who you are to walk intimately with you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you impact every person in this room. Thank you, God. That we breathe you in. Holy Spirit's going to give people rest this week. Some of you are going to have incredible encounters with God like never before, and that's beautiful. But those encounters aren't just for you, but they're for you to share them with others about the goodness of God, always pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. I pray over the next few weeks leading up to Easter as well, God, Pray for an incredible move of your Holy Spirit. As we radically invite people, you can open up your eyes. We're going to invite people to church, right, guys? We're going to invite people to our Easter service. But, man, it's only going to get better. I'm feeling it. It's going to get better and better. Holy Spirit's moving, and you've done such a great job. Why don't we give God a hand this morning? Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Wow.